Chapter 13 As they set off across the lake in three canoes, Mr. Abner and the equipment in one canoe, three club members in each of the other two, the weather was not promising. High clouds had drifted across the sun, and both the sky and water were in ominous gray. A light fog made it hard to see where the water left off and the sky began. No one said anything, only the sound of the paddles splashing rhythmically in the water and the raucous honking of two large ducks flying overhead broke the silence. Della leaned forward, looking past Maya to Pete in the front of the canoe, matching her paddle strokes with his. The waves were stronger this trip, tossed by a warm but gusting wind, and it was more difficult to keep the small canoe moving forward. Is this a silent movie or what? Mr. Abner called from his canoe, several feet ahead of them. How about some noise, you guys? Anybody know any songs? No, Ricky, Gary, and Suki called in unison. It's too early on a Saturday morning for songs, Suki added. Anybody ever tell you guys you're a lot of laughs? Their advisor asked, paddling harder against the current. No, Gary called. Nobody. Well, they were right, Mr. Abner retorted. Everyone offered him a half-hearted laugh. I can't believe we're doing this, Maya muttered. I can't believe we're going back to that dreadful island. Maya, shh, Della warned. The wind could carry your voice. You know why we have to go back. Let's just try to make the best of it. Maya frowned, closed her eyes, and slipped her hands under her sweatshirt to warm them. A light drizzle began to fall. The gray sky grew darker. The thickening fog made everything seem eerie and menacing. Perfect, Della thought. This is just a perfect atmosphere for a return to Fear Island. A return to the scene of a murder. Stop thinking that way, she scolded herself. It wasn't a murder. It was an accident. She thought of the body lying there under the crackling brown leaves. She thought of someone, the dead man's partner, going to the body, tearing the silver skulls from the chain around the dead man's neck. She thought of the plastic zap gun lying there beside the body. Would she really have the nerve to go back to the ravine and retrieve the gun? Yes, she had no choice. She couldn't leave it there for the police to find. She thought of the dead man, of his body under the leaves, decaying, decaying, decaying. Would she have to look at him? No. She grabbed the gun up off the ground and run. Maybe Pete would come with her. Yes, he probably would. She looked at Pete, rowing at the front of the canoe, his dark hair blowing in a strong breeze. She realized she was really starting to like him. When she had arrived at the lake an hour before and had seen Gary arrive with Suki, it hadn't bothered her. She had looked at Gary and not felt those pangs, those feelings of, why aren't we together? Now Gary had become just another guy, just another guy from school, and she was glad. The rain stopped and the cloud cover lightened a bit as they climbed out of the canoes and dragged them onto the rocky beach. The whole island appeared in shades of gray. The trees, the dunes, the beach. Della felt as if she had stepped into a black and white movie. Pull the canoes over by the trees, Mr. Abner instructed, not noticing that they already were. We'd better be careful, Della thought. We'd better not give away the fact that we already know the island. Is this whole island solid woods? she asked. I haven't been here since I was a little girl. As far as I know, Mr. Abner said, tugging his canoe with all of the tents and equipment inside. I've never been to the other side of the island. Don't know what's over there. He let go of the canoe. Hey, that's a good idea. Let's hike to the other side of the island. It's a great morning for a hike. Oh, no, Suki groaned. No one else showed much enthusiasm either. Uh, don't we have to set up the tents and get firewood and stuff first? Ricky asked hopefully. We'll leave everything with the canoes, Mr. Abner said, choosing to ignore their reluctance. We'll set up when we get back. Come on, everyone. Drop everything and take your backpacks. It won't be a long walk, just two or three hours at most. He picked up his blue backpack and swung it onto his shoulders, an excited smile on his face. Della and her friends could see that there was no use grumbling about it. They were going on a hike across the island to the other side. Great day for a hike, Pete said, walking next to her, an ironic grin on his face. How you doing? Me? Okay, I guess. I sure wish this weekend were over. She picked up her backpack. He held it for her while she shoved her arms through the straps. You and me both, he said, sighing. The drizzle began again. Not exactly rain, but a fine mist that made everything feel wet, even the air they breathed. I'll go with you to get the zap gun. Maybe we can sneak away during the hike. Della looked up and saw Mr. Abner staring at them. Maybe we'd better do it after the hike, she whispered. We'll go later, when everyone's gathering firewood. Thanks, she whispered. I just hope we're not hiking the whole weekend. 
Mr. Abner is a lot more gung-ho about this than I thought he'd be. They followed the others into the woods. Della pulled up the hood on her sweatshirt. It covered her head and hair, but it didn't keep out the cold or the increasing sense of dread she was feeling. She didn't want to be walking again through these woods, her sneakers crunching over the dead brown leaves. The ground sloped sharply up. Her sneakers slid on the mud. The footing was getting slippery from the rain. She grabbed Pete's arm and he helped pull her up a steep incline. They stepped carefully over a fallen tree and followed the others deeper into the woods. Suddenly, Mr. Abner came jogging hurriedly back to them, holding a video camera up to his eye. Don't look at the camera, he instructed, pointing it at Della and Pete, walking backward to keep them in the picture. They stopped to stare at the camera. No, don't stop, he cried. Keep walking. Act natural. Mr. Abner, what are you doing? Della asked. I'm making a complete record of our overnight, he said, still taping them. When we get back home, I'll make a copy for everyone to keep. The poor guy, Della thought. He just doesn't know what's going on. He has no idea that this isn't an experience the rest of us are going to want to remember. This camping trip is something we're all going to want to forget as quickly as possible. You can at least smile, Mr. Abner urged, walking backward, keeping the video camera fixed on them. Della and Pete made a feeble attempt at smiles. Then, suddenly, Mr. Abner's heel caught on an upraised root, and he toppled over backward into the mud. The six club members tried their best not to laugh, but the sight of him falling onto his backside, video camera leaping out of his hands, his long legs flying into the air, was too hilarious, and they all enjoyed a good laugh. He climbed up slowly, looking embarrassed, and checked over the video camera to make sure it was still functioning. Hiking rule number one, don't face the wrong way when you walk, he said, brushing wet leaves and dirt off the seat of his jeans. Then he added, I just did that to wake you guys up. That's the first laughter I've heard all morning. He was right, Della realized. They weren't doing a very good job of acting normal. But what could they do? None of them, not even Ricky, felt like joking around. It was hard for Della to even think straight. She just kept thinking about how she had to sneak away and what she had to do. They hugged for what seemed like days, stopping only once to eat the sandwiches they had brought. Finally, feeling tired and extremely edgy, they reached their destination. The other side of the island, not surprisingly, looked exactly like the side they knew. The pine trees gave way to the low dunes of a rocky beach. If there was land across this side of the lake, they couldn't see it. Low clouds and fog blocked the view. It's kind of pretty, Della said to Pete, staring out at the lake. So gray and mysterious. It's almost streamlike. I guess, Pete said, shifting his backpack. He groaned. This thing was light when we started out. Now it weighs a ton. Mr. Abner finished videotaping the shoreline and lowered his camera. Doesn't look as if those clouds are going to lift, he said, making a visor with his hand on his forehead to shield his eyes from the glare. What do we do now? Ricky asked him grumpily. We head back, of course, Mr. Abner said, still staring across the lake. You mean we have to hike back through the woods? Maya moaned. Do you want me to bring the car around? Mr. Abner asked, laughing. I'll tell you what. Let's go back along the beach. We'll walk around instead of through. That idea seemed to please everyone. But by the time they made it back to their canoes and supplies, it was late afternoon. Their sneakers were soaked, they were chilled through and through, and their legs ached from trudging so far over sand. Ricky plopped down in one of the canoes. Della and Maya dropped to their knees in the cold, wet, pebbly sand. Ah, that was exhilarating, the revisor cried, smiling happily as he carefully packed away his video camera. Hey, don't sit down, guys. Fun time is over. Now it's time to start working. Muttering and complaining, they carried the tents and supplies to a clearing beyond the tree line. Della realized that they weren't far from their old campsite, a hundred yards or so farther into the trees. After the tents were put up, Mr. Abner sent them out for firewood. Try to find dry wood, he instructed. Everything's soaking wet, Suki snapped. Where are we going to find dry wood? I think I have some at home, Ricky offered. I'll go home for it. Ricky, Mr. Abner said sternly. No, really, I don't mind, Ricky joked. I'll go get it and be right back. Look for wood that's under leaves or under other wood, Mr. Abner said, ignoring Ricky's plea. It'll be drier than wood that's been exposed. We can burn wood if it's damp. It'll just take a little longer to get going. The six of them started off in different directions. Maya, stay here and help me unpack the dinner supplies, Mr. Abner said. Maya immediately turned and headed back into the center of the campsite, looking relieved. Get lots of wood, the advisor shouted. Looks like it's going to be a cold, dreary night. I don't know about cold, but he's right about dreary, Suki muttered to Gary as they headed off together. Bet I can cheer you up, Della heard Gary say to Suki. Stop it, Gary. Get your hands off me, she heard Suki protest. 
but not too convincingly. Della found Pete tossing wet sticks across the ground. Nothing is dry, he muttered. Abner's crazy. A sudden wind came up, shaking tree branches and sending leaves flying in different directions. This is the longest day of my life, Della sighed. You'll feel better once me, Pete's voice trailed off. He looked around. No one was in sight. Hey, let's go. Huh? Let's go get Ricky's gun, right now, while there's still a little light. Della hesitated. She could feel her throat tighten and a heavy feeling begin to grow in her stomach. I guess. Abner's busy with Maya in camp. He won't notice. We'll go grab the gun and be back here in a couple of minutes. Okay, Della said, pulling up her sweatshirt hood. I guess this is as good a time as any. They started off together in the general direction of the ravine. Hey, where are you guys going? It was Abner. They turned around, startled to see him in the woods. We were just, uh, come on, guys, Abner scolded, shaking his head. You know the rules. No hanky-panky. But we were it, Della protested. Of course you were, Abner insisted, laughing. Come back closer to camp. You don't have to go this far for wood. Okay, Della and Pete said in unison. They followed him back to the campsite and started gathering firewood at the edge of the tree line. We'll never get away. Never, Della moaned. Shh, look, Pete pointed. Abner and Maya had gone to the other side of the clearing. Come on, he can't see us. Let's try again. Okay, quick, she said, her eyes on Abner. Do you remember exactly where the ravine is? Pete asked. Her sweatshirt hood was caught in her hair. He helped her straighten it out. His hand felt cold as it brushed against her forehead. I I'm pretty sure. Then let's go, Pete said. They hurried into the trees. As they quickly made their way over the wet, slippery ground, he reached for her hand. He dropped it when they heard the scream. It came from the campsite, a shrill, ear-piercing scream, a scream of absolute horror. Della recognized it immediately. It's Maya, she cried. Chapter 14 A second scream tore through the trees, a scream for help. Della and Pete got to the campsite together, just as Gary and Suki appeared, looking frightened and confused. Maya, where are you? Della called. Ricky stumbled into the clearing, carrying a stack of sticks in his hands. He tossed the sticks next to one of the tents. What's all the racket? Over here, Maya cried. Her voice came from near the edge of the woods on the other side of the tents. Help, please! Her heart pounding, Della ran around the tents toward Maya's voice, followed by the others. They found Maya on her knees beside Mr. Abner, who was lying on his back. She was cradling the advisor's head in her arms. As the others drew closer, they could see that his eyes were closed, his mouth open, a rivulet of blood trickling down from his scalp. Maya, Mr. Abner, what? He's out cold, Maya told them. I can't bring him to. But who did it? Did you see it happen? Did he fall? Was he shot? Pete and Gary knelt down beside Maya. Gary put his hand on Mr. Abner's sweatshirt above the chest. His heart is beating okay, he said. What happened? He was hit, Maya said, her voice trembling. Hit over the head. I saw someone, a man. He ran off into the trees. She looked past them to the woods. That way. A man? Della cried. Did you get a good look at him? Who was it? Gary asked. I don't know. It was like a blur, Maya said. A dark blur. He was wearing a black jacket, I think. Mr. Abner groaned and turned his head, but his eyes didn't open. We've got to get help for him, Maya said. She placed his head gently on the ground and backed away. The sleeves of her sweatshirt were stained with dark blood. He's hurt bad, I think. Della was surprised at how well Maya reacted in an emergency. She's stronger than anyone gives her credit for, Della thought. Who did it? Why? Suki asked, hands on her hips. She looked more angry than frightened. Maybe it's the dead man's partner, Pete said, looking at Della. Maybe he's followed us back here. And now he plans to croak us, one by one, Ricky said, staring into the trees, his round face suddenly tight with fear. Shut up, sure, Suki snapped. You always know how to make things worse. What could be worse, Maya said quietly. She ran around to the other side of the tent. A few seconds later, she reappeared carrying a rolled-up sleeping bag, which she tucked under Mr. Abner's head. Someone unfold another sleeping bag and cover him up, she ordered. Pete ran to get one. We're helpless here, Della said, thinking out loud. We can't help Mr. Abner, and we can't do anything to protect ourselves if, if whoever did it comes back. Some of us have got to go to town for help, Maya said, helping Pete spread a sleeping bag over the teacher. I'll go, Ricky cried immediately. Not too eager or anything, are you sure, Suki said. Get off my case, Ricky snapped angrily at her. Who's going to make me? Suki made a face back at him. 
Stop it. Come on. Knock it off, Gary said heatedly. We've got an emergency here. He's losing a lot of blood, Maya said, pressing a handkerchief against the side of Mr. Abner's head, trying unsuccessfully to stop the flow. Okay. We'll go get help, Gary said. Come on, Ricky. Suki. Let's go. You three stay and watch him. Della watched the three of them hurry toward the canoes. Suddenly, Ricky stopped and turned around. Hey, he called back. My zap gun. What about my zap gun? I'll go get it now, Della answered. She took a deep breath and watched until they disappeared into the trees. I guess I have no choice, she said to Pete. I've got to get the gun back before they come back with the police. Okay, I'll go with you, Pete said, looking down at Mr. Abner. We'll be back as soon as we can, Maya. No, Maya cried, grabbing his arm. You can. What? You can't leave me here alone. But Maya, Della said. No, I mean it. That's not fair. What if the man comes back? There won't be anyone here to help me. You can't leave me like that. You just can't. She's right, Della told Pete. But, Della, I'll have to go get the gun by myself, Della said. You stay and help Maya. But I don't want, we don't want to come back and find Maya hit over the head too. Or worse, it would be our fault, Pete. You've got to stay with her. I'll be right back. I'll run right to the ravine, grab the gun, and run right back. Pete pulled out of Maya's grasp. No, I can't let you. Look, Della said. She held up the whistle she was wearing around her neck. See this? I have a whistle. It's real loud. If I'm in any kind of trouble, I'll blow it, okay? A whistle? Pete didn't look convinced that this was a good plan, but he looked at Maya, pale and trembling beside him, and he realized he had no choice but to let Della go on without him. I'll be right back, really, Della insisted, thinking that maybe if she kept repeating that, she'd start to believe it. She leaned over on tiptoes and gave Pete a quick kiss on the cheek, for luck. Then she turned and forced herself to jog into the woods. Wait, stop, Della. Pete came running after her. Here, take this. He handed her a big metal flashlight. It's getting kind of dark. She took it from him, surprised by how heavy it was. They turned and walked in opposite directions. She heard Maya calling to him, afraid that he had changed his mind and had left her there. Maya is such a baby, Della thought. But then she argued with herself. Maya's right. She has good reason to be scared, and so do I. She gripped the flashlight tightly. I can use it as a weapon if I need to, she thought. A weapon? What am I thinking of? Have I completely lost my mind? Is this really me, walking through these woods to find a dead man, to retrieve a stupid plastic gun, alone in the woods while some creep prowls about, some creep who hit Mr. Abner over the head, and now might be following me, might be watching me, might be ready to... Stop! Just stop thinking, she told herself. Don't think about anything. Keep moving, keep walking till you find the ravine, and shove everything out of your mind. There's nothing you can think about now that will make you feel better. Nothing you can think about that will make you feel any safer. What about Pete? I'll try thinking about Pete. But she pictured Pete being hit over the head. Pictured a man in a black jacket running through the trees. Pictured Pete lying on the ground like Mr. Abner, blood trickling down to the ground from his head. Blood. Blood on the ground. Blood everywhere. No, I can't think about Pete. I'll think about home. Safe, warm, quiet. But the dead man's partner was right on my porch, leaving his envelope with the silver skull and the frightening note. Right on my porch. He was practically inside my house. He knows where I live. He knows me. Is he watching me now? Is he watching me push my way through the woods? Is he waiting for me to stumble? Waiting for me to fall so that he can pounce? Is he waiting for his revenge? Waiting to pay me back for killing his friend? For burying his friend in leaves and running away? No. Stop thinking. Della looked around and realized she had lost her sense of direction. It all looked the same to her. The rustling trees, the clumps of brown weeds, the floating, shifting dead leaves. Had she been here before? Was she walking in circles? No. This had to be the right direction. She remembered that large, square rock at the bottom of the low hill. Yes, she was heading to the ravine. She was nearly there. Maybe. She just had to concentrate on where she was going, chase these other thoughts from her head. It suddenly grew darker, as if someone had turned off some lights. She clicked on the flashlight, throwing a narrow beam of white light on the ground ahead of her. Yes, that was better. At least she could see the ground now, could see to step over that fallen branch and step around that hole and walk away from those clumps of thorns. It's right up here, I think. She stared over the beam of light, trying to see through the trees. She was climbing a steep slope now. Yes, she remembered it. She remembered how steep it suddenly became, how surprisingly steep and... What was that light? To her right, she saw a flash of white light through the trees. Was that just my light? A reflection of my light? No. She saw it again, a narrow beam cut off by a branch. 
Thinking quickly, she clicked off her flashlight. Why give away where I am? A chill went down her back. She struggled to catch her breath. Who was it? The light disappeared, then reappeared a few feet away, a few feet closer. The light seems to flicker and float as if free of gravity, as if emitted by some giant firefly hovering among the trees. Maybe it's Pete. Yes, of course. It's Pete. He got Maya settled down and came after me. Should she call to him? Yes. No. Yes. But what if it isn't Pete? What if it's the creep who hit Mr. Abner? No, don't call to him. The light moved closer. Pete? Her voice came out tiny and frightened. The word just slipped out. She hadn't meant to say it, but now that she had, she repeated it. Pete? A little louder this time. The light floated closer. She could hear footsteps now. Pete? A cough. She heard a man's cough. It wasn't Pete. He was coming toward her now. She froze. How stupid. How stupid to call out and let him know where she was. To bring him right to her. No. No. Stop thinking. Stop thinking and run. She turned and started to flee. She wasn't thinking about anything now. Her mind was empty, clear. All thoughts had been chased away by her fear. She was just running, listening to the crunch of fast approaching footsteps behind her, and running, running over the slippery brown leaves, over the fallen limbs and branches, through burrs and brambles and clumps of tall, stringy weeds. She gripped the flashlight tightly in her hand, but she hadn't turned it on. She hadn't time, and she didn't need it. She was running on radar now, the radar of fear. It carried her through the darkness, but the light behind her was floating closer, closer. She was climbing now, up a steep slope, climbing away from the light, toward... Before she realized it, she was near the top of the incline. Before she realized it, she was at its crest, then over it. She didn't stop, didn't see the fallen tree in her path. She stumbled, didn't cry out, didn't make a sound, too frightened to scream. She knew where she was. She knew where she was falling. She knew she had found the ravine. And as she fell forward, almost diving down the side, she saw the dreadful, dreadful pile of leaves, and she knew she was falling right into it. Chapter 15 She was right on top of him. I'm going to be sick, she thought. A wave of nausea rolled up from her stomach. She took a deep breath and held it, waiting for the feeling to pass. Dizzy. I'm so dizzy. She tried to push herself up with her arms, but her hand slipped on the wet leaves. I'm right on top of him, on top of his dead, decaying body. She forced herself to her feet, still holding her breath, still feeling dizzy. I was lying on top of a dead man. The flashlight. Where is the flashlight? That's it, Della. Think about the flashlight. Think about finding the zap gun and getting out of this ravine. Don't think about the leaf pile. Don't think about the decaying, rotting body you were just lying on. Don't think. Wait. The leaf pile. It was so flat. She remembered the mound of leaves they had left there. Well, maybe a lot of the leaves had blown away. Gingerly, she kicked at the leaves with her sneaker. They fell away at her touch. She kicked again, probing deeper into the pile. Nothing but leaves. Breathing heavily, she stepped onto the leaf pile. Her sneaker sank down deep until it touched the ground. She kicked at the leaves again, again, sending them flying in all directions. He was gone. The body was gone. He wasn't in the leaf pile. The body had been moved. She stood, staring at the scattered leaves. She didn't know how to feel. She felt relieved that she hadn't been lying on top of the decaying body. But the fact that he'd been moved brought a flood of questions to her mind. Shaking her head as if that could clear it, she bent down low and searched in the leaves for the zap gun. She shoved the leaves aside with both hands, pawing at them like a dog trying to dig up a lost bone. Not finding the gun, she stood up and began plowing through the whole area, dragging her sneaker slowly in straight lines kicking into clumps of matted leaves. No success. I've got to find it, she said aloud. I've got to. She dragged her shoe across a wider area with no success. It's got to be here, she muttered to herself, bending low and scrabbling among the leaves. Her hand hit something hard. Startled, she picked it up. It was her flashlight. This should be a help, she thought. She clicked it on. No light. She clicked it again. Again. It must have broken during her fall. Frustrated, she banged it against the side of her jeans leg. Ouch! Take it easy, girl. Don't lose control. The light still wouldn't come on. She was about to toss the flashlight away when she heard the cough. Behind her, she spun around. Someone was standing above her in the darkness. First, she saw his black, mud-splattered boots. Then she saw his straight-legged jeans. Her eyes went up to the leather bomber jacket. No, it can't be, she screamed in a voice she didn't recognize. You were dead. I know you were dead. With a growl more animal than human, he leaped off the side of the ravine, 
hurling himself at her and grabbing her throat with both hands. 